Hi everyone, it's Nancy at Sipping and Painting Hamden. We're gonna be painting, painting this lovely painting tonight called Snowy Sonata. So let's get started. So I'm gonna be using a 16 by 20 white pre-primed canvas, kind you pick up at Michael's or Hobby Lobby. I, uh, Michael's is good to us, so I like to give them a plug. Uh, this is our original painting. I was painting a little earlier, so my palette's a mess, forgive me. But I'm gonna be uh, using I'm not gonna be making any green, so I don't need yellow. I'm just gonna use red, blue, and white. Here's some clean red and white. Okay, red, blue, and white. And then black. Okay, so red, blue, white, and black. I also need a few different sizes of brushes. Three different sizes of brushes will do absolutely just fine, okay? All right, and make sure you have some water in a jar or container. Make sure mine's clean enough. I also have something to drink because it is sipping and painting after all. I've got tea today, but I might mix it up and get some, uh, some wine. And then I've got a stack of napkins. All right. I, uh, by the way, I also have a second plate for mixing colors, sometimes that really helps. Okay, so what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna wet my canvas with just plain old water. And I'm gonna do that because Denver is a dry place and our paint can dry out really quickly in dry air, especially right now. I'm painting this in December of 2020. So uh, the heater's been on a while and the air is dry. And if I moisten my canvas with a little bit of water, it's gonna help me keep those paints thin enough to move across the canvas effortlessly. It'll really help those paints glide, especially when we're blending this inner circle here, or this circle. So a little water, that'll help our canvases, our paints move smoothly across the canvas. That's what I meant to say. All right, a little water does the trick. Great. I am also, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put this down. This helps my canvas from not jumping all over the place. Okay, so the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick up my big brush and I'm gonna pick up just plain old white paint. Now this is gonna sound silly, I know, but I'll explain exactly why I'm doing that in just a moment. All right, so. Hold on one second, I'm kind of tangled up in my microphone cord. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a softball size white dot right here. First it's starting in a dot and then I'm gonna circle out, circle out until it's the size of a softball. And notice I used a lot of paint. There's a lot of paint there. Now you might say your canvas is white, your paint is white, why are you doing this? And I'll tell you, I want the consistency to just be a paint consistency right there. It's gonna help us blend out as we go. All right. So for the next circle, I'm gonna need to take mostly white, mostly white and a little bit of red. I, what I want here is a pale pink, a very pale pink. Now, I wanna tell you about my paints. We use, I'm using primary colors only when I do these videos. And the reason I am doing that is that I want people to know that they can paint with just five colors of paint, red, yellow, blue, black, and white, and they can mix almost every single color they need. Now at our studio in general, we have about 50 different colors of paint. And we use them all. We have 500 paintings in our gallery and we use lots of different colors. So my red is going to serve as my pink, right? I'm gonna mix it with white. It's not gonna be exactly the same brightness as a pink that comes out of a tube. So this might be fluorescent pink or hot pink. We don't really know. But we're gonna approximate it with what we have, red and white, 
And we're gonna come close enough that our painting's gonna look great, just watch. So around that white softball, I'm gonna put this very pale pink, very pale pink. And then I'm gonna just slowly, slowly circle out, circle out. until it looks like basically a tire with that's missing the wheel inside. Now, I messed up my shape in the center. It's okay. It's all right if you do that, no problem. We can go back in and put bright white in there later. Don't worry. Don't worry, be happy, right? Maybe it looks like a giant donut. Tire, inner tube, donut, you get the idea. And I can even fix that circle because I can always go over that with stark white later. But I don't wanna put the darker pink in here. It's still whiter in here. I'll come back in later and I'll fix that center area to be more white. But for now, I just want this lighter pink. Because you're watching recording, I know that it's gonna take you a lot longer to paint than I am. So just remember, you can stop and then start it when you're caught up. I'm gonna keep on going. But just remember, you have the control to stop and start the video as you go, all right? Okay, so after we get that pink on, I'm gonna keep adding more red to make it a deeper pink. So instead of this very delicate baby booty pink, now it's gonna go to more Pepto-Bismol. Just making sure it's mixed in. Um, I didn't even clean my brush in between. I just picked up more red and just mixing that in, just mixing it in. All right, now to blend, this is still wet. That's good. I want to overlap it. So if you're somebody who's mowed the lawn before, you'll know what I mean. You have to overlap your rows so that you cut the grass evenly. If you try to go next to the row and not overlap, you'll have some that wasn't cut. So I'm, I started that darker pink overlapping with the thinner, or the lighter pink rather. All right. And I'm gonna just use some more here, expand this out a little bit more. So this is like a big old, pink target. And then once I've used all of that pink up on my, you know, from my brush on the canvas and my brush is dry, well, let's just go round and round. I'm gonna make sure all that um, paint is off of my brush and my brush is, I'm really just using a dry brush on the outside here. It's not depositing much paint. Okay, so dry brush, you see that? Then with my brush pretty dry, there's no paint on it. I can just go over that area where they meet just a little bit, just, just to soften, just to soften, just to soften. I wanna make it so I can't tell where the white stopped and the pink starts. And then we're gonna keep going until we get to red and then purple. And I want it to just look seamless. Like we don't really know where one color starts and one stops because they're blended in together.
All right, once again, go ahead and pause. Even when I keep going, you can still pause and then start it when you're ready, okay? I'm gonna pick up, I'm just gonna make some more of that pink for myself. And I'm gonna add even more red. And now it's almost like a pale red. And I'm gonna go around that circle. And when it hits the top, just pretend that there's more up there. You can paint the top of your painting as well so that your canvas, so it's like your painting wraps around the structure of the canvas. So what I mean is I can move this and I can paint up here. And I'll just keep doing that as I go. Or I can wait and add it later. Either way, they both work. <laughs> I was just thinking about what this looks like. Kind of strange. But it's gonna be beautiful when we're done, I promise. There's a guy on TV that sells suits and he says, I guarantee it, men's warehouse. All right, so I have this dark purple uh, pink ring. And when you run out of paint on your brush, just really softly, really softly, go over where they overlap, go over where they overlap and just soften it. So you don't really know where one starts and the next one stops. Just soften, yeah, just soften it. We wanna just blend the two together by just overlapping them and softening, softening with our brush. So we don't know where one starts and the other stops. Just keep going over wherever you see a harsh line, just go over it and that's how you blend. People will tell you you can't blend acrylic paint. It's just not true, not true at all. Of course you can. All right, I'm gonna make more of that pink. And I'm gonna pick up more of that red. I'm gonna make the same shade I did before. First. Is that dark pink? All right, then I'm gonna knock all the clumps off. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick up some of my blue, just a little bit, just a little, and I'm gonna put it into that dark pink. Now blue, the kind of blue that I'm using is a phthalo blue and phthalo blue is very powerful blue. It will turn things dark in a moment. It, it takes over, it's a really, really powerful color. So I can add a little, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try it, but I can always add a little white. All right. Add a little bit of white to that. I don't want it to get dark on me too fast.
So that, in other words, I put on too much blue. Just put the tiniest dab of blue until you, yeah. That's gonna be better. I'm gonna pick up a little bit more red too. So I guess I could have just avoided adding more of this. Just, just going easier on the blue to start. All right. And I'm going to go around my painting with a, this pale purple. And another ring. I always recommend stepping back five to 10 feet when you paint, just to see what you've done, because something might look like a nice curve to you, and you might step back five feet and say, wow, that is a lopsided circle, or that's more of a, you know, it's a little rectangular. It's always a good idea to step back, always a good idea. Step back about five feet and see what you've got. All right, so I've got this, other circle of purple, of pale purple, pale purple. So I'm gonna need to blend those a little bit more. I wanna get rid of some more of this paint. I'm just gonna go ahead and get rid of it down here and go over it later. Now I noticed on the original, it didn't go to purple quite so fast. That's okay. I can let this dry a little bit more. See this color down here? That's really what I was going for. So I might go back in, mix a little more pink. You can always, always fix things, always. I'm gonna mix a little more pink. Sometimes when you're painting, uh, when you're color, when you're trying to blend colors, sometimes you have to go back and forth a bit. I'm going to go ahead and use this as a blending color to to blend away the hard line of the purple. I'm just adding more pink right on top of the edges where that purple. Purple meets the pink. I just want to make, make it a little smoother transition. Like I said, sometimes you have to go back and forth a bit. All right. Yeah. To see how that creates a little smoother transition to the purple. And it's okay if it's not neat, it's okay. Those rings around the moon are reflections of light. And if you've ever gone down to Larimer Square in Denver or someplace that had a lot of, maybe a harbor where they have a lot of outdoor lights and there's reflected light around it, it's not in perfect circles. It's more like this, like rings. And sometimes the rings are solid and sometimes they're broken and they gradually change to other colors. So if it looks a little messy, embrace it. That's fine, that's fine. We just want this to gradually change to purple. All right. And then I'm gonna pick up more blue and I'm gonna finish this off with blue. 
I'm going to let that blue overlap with that purple down here. I'm going to let it overlap. I didn't clean my brush. I'm just letting that blue paint just mix with the purple on my brush. And keeping that same curve that I had in the circle, same curve. Right down into the corners. All the way down, all the way down. Now in those upper corners, I'm gonna do the same thing up here with just a little bit of blue in the upper corners and keep that same curve. And then I'm gonna paint the sides of my painting where I haven't painted it yet to match the colors that I put on in those areas. Now you don't have to be quite as fussy about the sides. Most people aren't even gonna see them. But like I said, if you paint the sides, you don't have to get a frame and that'll save you money. And who doesn't like to save money? I don't know anybody. I almost put my brush in my tea. That wouldn't taste good. Trust me. I've done it. All right. Now you might say, oh, your circles aren't perfect anymore. That's okay, we can go back and fix all of it. All right here, this comes in a little bit too much. I can just let this dry and I can go back and fix anything I need to fix. No worries, no worries. But I should let it dry a bit before I try to paint it. If you paint wet over wet, sometimes you just pick up paint rather than lay it down so it won't sit on top of it. So I'm probably gonna have to let this area up here dry more and then I'll be able to fix that and make it pink again. Acrylic paint is great, but it doesn't like to it, it doesn't like to uh, have you mess with it too much when it's wet. If you mess with it too much when it's wet, it will fight you. I'm gonna let that dry a little bit. I switched to my medium brush because I can use this medium brush 
to really go back in and tweak anything. Now that white was dry. I could tell by looking at it, it wasn't shiny anymore. It was dry in the center. So I can go back in and fix my softball. That's this area. I can go back in and fix it now. No worries. You start, when you want to make a ball, start in the center. Circle out slowly. Just circle out slowly. Circle out slowly. And that'll help you keep that circular shape. If you just go slowly, let the muscle memory be working for you. Oops. Try to go the opposite direction. My brain was like, not ready for that one yet. Gotta go slow, go slow, go slow. Just looking, there's somewhere in this area that looks a little orangey. I don't know why. I don't have any yellow on my pep. I do have some yellow on my pep, but I was avoiding it. So just go ahead and tweak anything that doesn't look right to you. Step back five feet and then tweak to your heart's content. This doesn't have to be smooth circles. They could alternate. You could put a whiter circle, you know, after a pinker one and go back and forth. They don't have to be perfect. They don't have to blend perfectly. It's just your preference. And like I said, those light rings around a, a light source, sometimes they're more streaky. So it, it's just really your personal preference. And if yours is streakier than mine, embrace it. That's actually awesome. Not a bad thing at all. I think the streaks actually give it a little more character, to be honest with you. A little more visual interest. But keep your, you know, keep your streaks in a nice curve. Keep them curvy. All right, now we are gonna have to let this dry. We'll have to let this dry a bit. I put my paint on pretty thick. I'm not sure how you put yours on, but we do have to let it dry because I don't wanna come over it with black and have the black just smear all over the place. Um, and this, the bottom should be a little bit dry for the white paint. We could probably go ahead and put on a little of the snow at the bottom if you want, but I think it's better to put it on after the black tree uh, because we're gonna be putting snow over the tree anyway. So let's let this dry. Probably take us about five minutes, maybe 10. I put it on a little bit thick, so maybe 10. So uh, let's let it dry for about 10 minutes and see how it goes then. Ooh, I might regret what I just did. Just want to, you know, I found that if you go for perfection, a lot of times you won't get it. You'll mess something up. So if you're 80% happy with something, that's my rule of thumb. It's probably best just to leave it alone. And when I don't, when I'm 80% happy and I don't do that, I frequently will do what I just did. I'll just come in and mess up something that was perfectly good. Uh, so I'm gonna leave it alone now. All right, be back in 10 minutes. Okay, so my painting is 100% dry, but it's close enough. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna paint a tree. I'm gonna show you how to paint a tree. 
Okay, so I'm gonna be using black paint for my tree. Make sure your brushes are uh, pretty big I'm, or pretty clean. I'm gonna use a big brush to start and I'm gonna to switch to a medium and a small. So make sure all your brushes are clean. I'm gonna pick up black paint on my biggest flat brush. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to make a trunk and I'm gonna make it off center. I don't like to paint things in the center uh, because it's a little more natural to paint them off center. All right, nature doesn't like things symmetrical. And plus that way the tree is on this side of the moon and then you can see the moon. So I'm gonna start down here. And first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just a lot of pressure at the bottom, a lot of pressure at the bottom. I'm gonna pull up and then I'm gonna twist. Remember before we did that quarter turn to make things smaller? Same thing, now that looks terrible, but that's cause it's just the first brush stroke. I'm gonna go right over it with another one, right over it, quarter turn, quarter turn. I wanna make the base of the tree widest and I want it to get thinner as it goes up. That just makes sense, right? Trees need a wider base so that they can stand. And every time I go up, my it's filling in the trunk and making that black more solid. All right, I'm gonna use that same brush and I'm gonna start, always start in the trunk, always start in the trunk in the trunk and then go out and quarter turn. Start in the trunk, go out, quarter turn. Notice I didn't start my branches at exactly the same place on both sides. I didn't start it right here because trees will grow and then they'll sprout a branch and then they'll grow a little more, they'll sprout another branch. So they usually don't come out at exactly the same place. But notice how I want the trunk to be wide. And then as the tree uh, grows and as the branches come out, then the trunk gets thinner. So that at the end of, the, of this tree making, the trunk is widest at the bottom and thinner as it goes out. And the same with each branch. Notice that they're thicker here, and as they go out, they get thinner. And I'm always starting in the trunk and going out. Always starting in the trunk and going out. And I'm curving these branches. I want them to be not straight, not straight. It's very rare for anything to be straight in nature. Okay, now, why is it that I always start in the trunk? I'll tell you because if I started in the sky and came in, I would be depositing more paint up in the sky. And that just doesn't make sense. Um, I don't want it to look like a cactus. I don't want the, this to be blocky and big. So if I start in the trunk and then I come out and just a little quarter turn on the end of my brush, then the branches will just naturally become thinner as they go out. Hope that makes sense. Now I'm gonna put some branches right in front of the moon, woohoo. All right, remember they get thinner as they go out. That might be enough of the big ones. It might be enough. This tree is a pretty good sized tree. It's got lots of characters. It's got stories to tell of people and animals that climbed it. I'm gonna stop there with my big brush and I'm gonna to switch to a medium brush now. All right, I'm gonna to switch to a medium brush. In fact, you could even switch to a small brush, whatever is more comfortable to you. But once you get to this stage where your branches look pretty good, you're gonna come out from each branch and you're gonna make smaller branches. Smaller branches come out of the bigger branches, right? So it goes trunk, branch, and then I think we can call them twigs, maybe, or, or sticks. And then from the sticks are twigs. And each time 
they're gonna get smaller and smaller, but they're always widest where they touch the, the, the bigger branch. And then they're always widest down here, like you have a shoulder and then they come out and they get thinner. And I like to spin my brush so that it stays bumpy and curvy. I don't want those twigs to be too, or, or sticks to be too straight. If they have a little crookedness to them, they're gonna look more realistic. You don't want them to be coming out perfectly straight. They just wouldn't look real if you did that. So when I'm painting, if I twist my brush, it just forces my hand to make more wiggly branches. And you can put as many or as few branches as you want. It's totally up to you, but here's the thing. However many you put on, you're gonna have to put snow on later. So oh, how did I make a pitchfork? That was kind of weird. All right, let me fix that. Oh, we've got, now if you make really twisty turny branches, you'll end up with something that'll remember, resemble um, Nightmare Before Christmas. Nothing wrong with that. So if you like that look, twisty turny, twisty turny, really twisty turny gnarly. But if you don't like that, then, you know, a little more graceful. Your style will come out and, and you're gonna be really comfortable with your style. That's really all that matters. The side's a little neglected over here. Now, if you make a mistake like that, if you make a part that's thicker than down here, then you have to make the whole thing up to it, that thickness. So it looks natural. Branches or twigs should always be thicker than the thing they came off of, right? Or thinner rather, thinner. So the trunk is the thickest and anything that comes off the trunk has to be thinner than the trunk. Anything that comes off of this branch needs to be thinner than it. Because as you go, it's just like your arm is the thickest, well, your body's the thickest, right? And then your arm, and then it goes down to your wrist. It just keeps getting thinner. And then each finger on your hand is thinner than your wrist. The same kind of order. Each one going out gets thinner than the thing it came out of. And just take your time and make sure, again, remember, don't pull in from the sky into the trunk or into the branch. Don't pull in from the sky. Don't do that, okay? Because you will end up putting too much paint on the ends and then you'll have little stubs. Then you might have to turn it into a cactus. Nothing wrong with cactuses. We love cactuses, right? But this isn't a painting of cac a cactus, it's a tree. So always start in the branch and then pull out from it, pull out. Trees are fun. I love painting trees. They're just, they really let you be creative. So remember as many branches as you put on your tree, you're gonna have to put snow on all those places. So just keep that in mind. If you wanna work hard, put lots of branches. You don't want to work too hard. Maybe not so many. I 
It's not too hard anyway. It won't be too hard. Let's see. And then look at the overall shape of your tree. Just kind of step back about five feet. Look at the overall shape. Make sure you like the shape okay. Remember some trees, maybe they had some branches knocked off in a storm and then what was left grew. Uh, so they might, they're, none of them are gonna be perfect. Maybe a bear climbed up there and fell asleep and broke a branch. You just don't know what your tree has been through. So don't make it perfect, make it a little imperfect and it will be more natural that way. It'll definitely be more interesting that way. All right, I think that's about enough of that for me. And make sure that the base is the widest part of the tree, okay? All right, and then it goes out gradually at the bottom like that. Now I'm gonna have to let all of that dry before I put in my snow. On the tree. But I can go ahead and put some snow on the bottom. Sure, why not? It's dry down here. Maybe not so much at the foot of the tree, but I'll just go gentle and fat gentle and easy on that part. So I'm just gonna scribble on some white. I'm not gonna use up all my white, go, go sparingly at the bottom. Don't put it on too thick because you're gonna need a lot of white up in here. I'm gonna be real gingerly around that tree trunk. Real careful. Paint a little on the sides. There we go. Just kind of skimming the bottom of the tree. Then I'm gonna take a small detail brush. Make sure it's clean because I was using that one for my tree. It had black on it. I don't want black. All right, and I'm just going to, now my white paint is getting really thick. It's getting really thick now because it's been sitting out a while. So if yours is thick, we want it to be thin enough to put snow on so go ahead and add a little water to it, a few drops of water. We want it to not be like Greek yogurt. We want it to be more like, oh, uh, thinner than that. I don't know, like a yogurt drink, I guess. And we wanna make sure you have enough white. All right, so I'm gonna add a little bit of water to mine my white so it's much thinner. All right, I'm gonna, mixing a little bit of water into my white paint. I want it to, um, I don't want it to be uh, like, you know what it'd be like? It'd be like a milkshake from McDonald's. Yeah, it should be a little drippy, a little drippy, okay? All right. And that should also give you more of it to work with. I'm gonna just flick up 
some little clumps of grass at the bottom. See that? Now it's kind of silly you think, oh, there's snow on, on this painting. But sometimes if it's a light snow, the snow will stick to each blade of grass. And this is just some little grasses just kind of sticking up. It's optional, you don't have to do that if you don't like it, but the painting has those. And then at the base of the tree, there's a little bit more clumpiness from the snow at the base of the tree. You can just scribble this on if you want. Scribble or grasses, you decide. Don't use up too much of your paint, though you need to leave some left over. All right, just messy and scribbly and some random grasses at the bottom. Now I can look for dry parts in my paint. Just don't paint over any wet paint, okay? Just, just be careful with that. Don't paint, paint over any wet paint. I'm adding a little bit more water to my paint. Still, it was still a little too thick. All right, so where there's dry corners, meaning where the branches meet, I'm looking for dryness because uh, I, I don't want to paint over wet paint, but where the corners meet at underneath that point, I'm going to put a little snow on top of the bottom branch. I'm going to put snow on top of branches that are horizontal. Horizontal means going back and forth. So anything that's horizontal is going to get a little line of snow on top of it. Why only on the top? Well, because snow wouldn't stick to the bottom, right? It would fall on the top and that would be it. But if a if a branch is growing straight up, don't 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 keep going up all the way to the top. Just anything that's um, where it would make sense that snow would stick on the tops of things, right? like on the top of your car, on the top of, top of a bicycle or a patio, but not so much on something, something straight up like that. It's gonna stick to the tops of branches, right on top. Anything that's horizontal gets a stripe. And I'm just being careful. If anything's still wet, I want to avoid it. You have to just think about each branch. Where, where would the snow stick? Where's the top? And this is a little tedious. It is. But I think it's also really pretty. You know when you wake up on a cold winter morning and you look out the window and you just see everything just coated with a layer of snow. And even if you hate snow, oh my goodness, it's so pretty. It just looks beautiful and peaceful until everybody, all the birds and the animals and the people disrupt it. It's just beautiful. Well, that's what we're doing here. We're just adding a layer of snow on the tops of anything that looks horizontal. Pulling all the way out to the end. This painting is called Snowy Sonata, like a symphony word, because it just feels so peaceful. It's almost uh, so it almost makes you want to sing. I don't know music. Hopefully, Sonata doesn't mean a march. <laughs> You'll have to put in the comments if I got that one wrong when I named this painting. Uh, it would fall in there. It would definitely fall in these little crevices. Little pockets. 
Those form a little pocket there for sure. Snowy Sonata. I first painted this one without any snow. And I thought, oh, that's boring. I don't know what, what it's missing, but it's boring. It's missing something. And then I put snow on. And then I went, oh, okay. Now I like it. It's fun to paint snow on trees. I, I can imagine, it's one of my favorite stories is if you are a fan of Bob Ross, he, um, he grew up in Daytona Beach, Florida. And, you know, hopefully you know who he is. He's a very famous painter. He had a TV show. Um, <laughs> and he grew up in, by the beach in Florida. And so then he uh, joined the military. And I don't know if he was drafted or if he just joined, but he was a drill sergeant. And he used to yell at people all the time. And um, they stationed him in Alaska. And he, because he was a beach kid, he didn't know anything about snow or cold and or ice. And he just got up there and he just fell on his little tuchus. That means bottom barrier, uh, <laughs> right off the plane. Uh, but he fell in love with Florida, I'm sorry, with uh, Alaska and the snow and the cold and the be beautiful mountains. He just loved it. He stayed up there uh, for a while and he, he painted. Uh, once One article said he worked as a bartender. I only read that one place, so I don't know. But he definitely painted when he was up there. And he, he uh, used those mountains as his inspiration for a whole lot of paintings that he did later on. Um, but I like to imagine how, how amazing that must have been to never have seen snow before and then end up in Alaska and have, have a quick introduction to it that way. That, that must have been quite a shock for a beach kid. I remember only put the snow on the places that make sense that where the snow would fall and stay. So it's on the tops of branches or in these little crevices because in these little crevices, they would just stick. It would be stuck in there. Be careful too that if it's still wet, stay away. The black paint is still wet. No one ever heard of gray snow. At least I didn't. All right. Almost there. It's been fun painting with you tonight. I hope you enjoyed this little painting. It's a this is a pretty easy painting until this part. Now it gets, it's getting a little tedious, but I hope you enjoyed it anyway. I hope you find it a peaceful way to spend your evening with me. And uh, I hope you'll paint again with me soon. We have lots of classes on our YouTube channel and it's growing every day. And uh, hopefully by the end of the pandemic, we'll have hundreds, we'll see, we'll see. But we sell these great kits. It's everything you need to paint these paintings for just $20. And so you uh, just come in uh, according to the hours on our calendar, the retail hours, and um, just uh, come in and you don't have to come all the way in if you're trying to avoid going in public places because of the pandemic. Just uh, knock on the door and I'll come out with, with a kit for you and uh, bring it up out there for you my iPad. But um, yeah, 20 bucks and you get everything you need in it to paint any of our paintings in our YouTube channel, any of their acrylic ones. And I show you how to mix all of the colors so that you don't have to, uh, you don't have to worry about that. And, and we just use those primary colors, but we're able to do any painting that way. Pretty cool, actually. You don't need to invest a lot of money in, in paints and 
uh, supply of canvases. Just come in when you want to paint. 20 bucks. Everything you have, everything you need will be right there for you. That's cheaper than going to a, much cheaper than going to uh, in-person class even. And you have everything you need and nothing you don't. All right, I'm just fiddling now and I'm gonna end up putting too much snow on this tree probably. Uh, but it's, like I said, it's been a pleasure to paint with you. And thanks so much. When you get to the very uh, end and you wanna end your painting, oh, you know what, there are some little lines. Uh, let me just tell you, there are some, I put some kind of random lines when I did the original of this painting with just showing like a little bit of detail in the trunk, uh, just to show that the snow might stick in some of those areas. So you can clean off your small brush on a napkin, but not, not with the water and just leave a tiny bit of that paint on your brush. And you can just kind of sketch in a little, uh, a little dry brush. Uh, dry brush means that there's not much paint on my brush. It's mostly just dry. But if I just kind of scribble in a little scribble on the trunk, it just kind of gives it a little dusting. So it looks like there's a little texture in the trunk. That's optional. You don't have to do that. Um, but it just gives it a little more realistic texture. But if you don't want to do that, I think your painting will look great just as a silhouette. It's not really necessary to do that, and maybe you don't even like it. Um, but when you get to the bot, when you get to the done, and you say, "Okay, I think I put snow on every every surface that is flat," and anything that we miss, well, we're just going to say that's where a bear came in and laid. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do, we have uh, lots of snow in our painting. It looks good. Notice these little stars or snowflakes. I'm not sure what they are. I'm gonna guess they're snowflakes. And so the last step of our painting is just taking white paint on the stick end of our one of our brushes. It doesn't really matter which brush you use, makes no difference. If you use a smaller stick, you'll have smaller snowflakes. If you use a larger stick, you'll have larger snowflakes. It doesn't matter. And you can get several snowflakes out of each pot. And I'm just gonna put snowflakes all over around this tree, in, inside between branches, pretty much wherever I see there will be snowflakes. To just really polish off this pretty little painting. I think the snowflakes add a nice little touch to this painting, don't you? Put as many or as few as you want. Your painting, your world, your call. Be sure you get the ones real high up too. Real high up. And if you painted the sides, put some on the sides too. All right. All right, when you finished your painting, 
and you have all the snowflakes on that you want, just dip your tiniest brush, your detail brush, into any color of paint, and then go ahead and put your initials in the bottom right-hand corner, or you can sign your name. I've just put my initials, that's easier. And I put my initials, and then when you put your initials in, if I see your painting in the Denver Art Museum, I'll know exactly who you are. All right, that's it for me. Thank you so much for painting with me. It's been a pleasure and I hope you enjoyed painting Snowy Sonata. Good night.